everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Carter. I'm one of the steering committee members for this year's collaboration workshop. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Essex, where I research the human rights impact of public sector technology, particularly on gender discrimination and stereotyping in the UK. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing today's panel, which is going to be on the practical implications of ethics in research and in software. Uh, Dr. Pamela Agridike's keynote yesterday asked us to think about some of the ethical challenges that can arise in software development and about the real world impact on individuals that software can have. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ghana Tacheng, Ariel Bennett, Steph Garasto, and Andrew Strait as our panelists today uh, to talk about some of the practical work that they have done in their various roles to design software and carry out research in an ethical way. And I'm going to pass now to each of the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Ghana. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. I am calling in from Kigali, Rwanda. My name is Garnet Aching, and I am a data and digital rights researcher at Policy, which is a, a feminist civic technology collective based in Uganda. Uh, yes, and I'm excited to be here to contribute my thoughts and learnings on ethics in research and software. Welcome, Garnet. Uh, good to hand over to Ariel to introduce yourself now. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Errol Bennett. I am the program manager for the Tools, Practices and Systems program at the Alan Turing Institute. I'm also a core contributor to the Turing Way project. Um, and for my sins, I am a ordinary committee member for United Tech and Allied Workers, which is a branch of the Communication Workers Union. Um, I'm one of the uh, unions that are currently trying to organize tech workers in the UK. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, discussing today the uh, impact that 360 degree ethics um, and its approaches can have on your work and the work that we do together to uh, improve research culture from uh, a software perspective. Thank you, Ariel. Welcome. Uh, I'll pass now to Steph. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Steph. I'm a lecturer in the science at the University of Greenwich, and I'm also a um, volunteer at a non-profit organization called DataClan UK, um, whose goal is to advance the use of responsible data science in the non-profit sector. So I'll be wearing a bit of two hats uh, today, but um, I, I, I do guess bring the same perspective, me being me, to both of them. Um, yeah, excited to uh, be here. Um, and have a chat about ethics. Thank you, Steph. And last but not least, I'll ask Andrew to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. I'm Andrew Strait. I'm the Associate Director of Research Partnerships at the Ada Lovis Institute. Uh, prior to that, I was at DeepMind's Ethics and Society team. And prior to that, I was a content moderator at Google for about seven years. A lot of our work at Ada focuses on various accountability mechanisms and, and also questions around research culture and research ethics. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk about some of our research and some of our experiences. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to start by asking each of the panelists in turn to talk about some uh, examples of how you implement ethics in the work that you do, um, and particularly what are the benefits of this implementation and how it strengthens your work. Um, and I'll start with Garnet. Um, thank you so much for your question. And I think just to give an illustration of, of how we um, use ethics in our work, I'm just going to give a fast, like a quick story of like a failure, a situation where ethics are not involved in research, right? So I think in 2020, there was a research, a randomized controlled trial research done by the World Bank um, in a community in Nairobi, Kenya, where I'm from. And so the study was to understand, um, to understand whether people living in the slum areas and the lower income areas of Nairobi would pay would pay their water bills if the no if landlords for the buildings where this low income populations lived would pay water bills if they they were threatened if the tenants were threatened with um, threats of disconnection and and ultimately if the water was disconnected right and so 
the study looked to understand how better to get people to pay their water bills. And by people here, I mean the landlords who own the buildings. But at the end of the day, um, 97 households mm. lacked water for like nine months, right? And so with this study, and these are people in the lower income areas of Nairobi. So without water, we, meet, we know that in such communities, waterborne diseases are rife mm -hmm. because now people have to look for water in other places. And this is not clean water as opposed to what the Nairobi um, water company would provide, right? And this research was sanctioned by different institutions, including Kenyan research boards. At the end of the day, people lacked water for close to a year. Um, the people who are supposed to pay back, who are the landlords, were not affected by this these water cuts because typically they don't live in these houses, right? And once you look at um, informed consent, like the people who lived in those buildings did not have an awareness of what was going on behind the scenes. They did not know that this was simply an experiment to force their landlords to pay back what to pay their water bills, their outstanding water bills, right? And so I think this is the greatest example of how of what could go wrong when we don't think about um, ethics when it comes to research. And how, how I think about it, how we as policy would do it in the first place was that such a research should not have been conducted in the first place, right? Um, what is the ethics? I mean, what is the rationale behind denying people who are already living, um, living in, in deplorable conditions and taking, taking their water away to test whether the owners of the houses they lived in would pay um, the bills. Like what is the rationale behind that? Um, and I think one of the first principles of research is that you're not supposed to do any harm. So it always make, has me thinking like, were the researchers thinking about the harm that would be caused to the populations? Why wasn't it, why wasn't the study direct, directed at the landlords instead? landlords who were wealthy people who did not live in these houses anyway, right? And the second thing I would, I would think about is um, contestation, right? When you're conducting research with populations, especially vulnerable and marginalized um, populations, they rarely have the agency to push back, right? And in this case, the researchers talked about, they also wanted to see whether the tenants would would um, complain to the landlords to make them to make them pay. So they were trying to see like their the agency in the situation, but they're forgetting that these are people who are lower income. They're already marginalized in society, and they barely have any bargaining power over their landlords, right? And so when we're thinking about research, especially when it comes to stuff like technology, where the population may not be able to understand what's going on. I, I think we see that in, in, in situations where AI is deployed on populations and people don't even understand how the systems work in the first place. So how can they contest something they do not know, right? And I think um, the last thing we think about is um, fairness. Um, was this research fair? No, because the risks were only distributed to the people at the, at the end of the chain, right? Um, and as we're thinking about research and if we're going to have any risks, are they distributed equally ac across people or are they just distributed the most marginalized people in, in, in the kind of society um, that we're researching on, right? And I think one of the things I thought about as somebody who's lived in Kenya is that once your water is disconnected, you still have to pay a fee for it to be connected again. And so just all these difficulties that come with somebody trying to understand whether a landlord would pay back, right? Just thinking about all the dynamics. And so at policy and, and myself as a researcher, we come into research from a decolonial and feminist perspective. So we like to think about decolonial values like fairness, safety, diversity, and feminist values like re reflexivity and positionality. So to shape the way we look at research and research on populations. And we use these two lenses because they help us understand the power imbalance involved in our studies and also understand the, the distribution of the impacts of our study. Yeah. 
Thank you, Garnet. I think the Nairobi Water Study is such a an awful cautionary tale about some of the things that can go wrong when you don't think about different stakeholders and the power involved in research. So I think that's such a useful illustration. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the same question to Steph about the some examples of how you implement ethics in the work that you do and how it strengthens your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, it, it's. I'm going to be talking about this question from a data kind volunteer perspective. Um, so I just wanted to um, highlight a bit of what we try to do within the organization that uh, as many things are by no means perfect and we, we try to improve it, to improve it every day. And the first thing I would mention is that I agree uh, in the sense of the one of the first question should be, at least in my opinion, uh, should this project take place in the first place? Uh, should we do it or should we not do it? Uh, and that's something that we, we, we grapple with and we haven't, uh, we, we, we try not to shy away from saying no uh, to, to, to projects and to, um, um, to ideas that we don't feel either that they, they can't be done. Um, in principle, in an ethical way. So um, I think there were some examples of um, microloans, um, projects using predictive models uh, that also were coupled with for-profit companies. So it was just a project we didn't feel uh, suitable for us to do. Um, uh, and also like, in terms of working with text, it's been taking us a long time we started looking at how to, to project that it heavily involved text with um, and language model with all the massive ethical implications that are still going on to these days. Um, the way we're trying to embed this and make sure that all these um, considerations are spotted early and continuously throughout the process is to try and um, encourage not only the staff, not only the ethics committee that that, um, um, that existed at the time, but also every single one of our volunteers uh, to spot potential ethical issues, to be able to raise them, to not shy away from any of these conversations that are needed. Um, and also to encourage them to think about solutions, but not immediate solutions. Like we're very aware that um, ethics is not fixed in, oh, we've thought about it, that's fine. Oh, we've added this one line of code, it's fine. That's that's not the case. And we're trying to um, have a working model where uh, time is allocated and resources are allocated uh, to be able to move on and um, address things better. Um, one, one example, um, was we, we had a case uh, some time ago about a, um, a food bank um, nonprofit that um, wanted to create a predictive model about to predict dependency from um, on, on their service, um, which, and there, there were lots of discussion with the, with the, with the chart itself. Um, and like, okay, how do we make sure that this doesn't involved in refusing food to people? How do we make sure that like this doesn't um, doesn't just uh, turn into a um, into something that into, into decision making system that doesn't have any um, I'm going to use an over use word sorry you in the loop um, and again I think what, what worked well in that case was that um, we were exactly able to spot all these problems early because we um, all of our volunteers were aware of them and um, brought them up at a time when we could address them, right? And, and at the end of the project where then it would have been um, less useful. Great. Oh, sorry, Steph, carry on. No, 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 I, I'm no. Done. sorry. No, no, no. Um, yeah, I think that's great. It's such a good point that ethics isn't a one and done system, that it's something that needs to be considered throughout the process of, of research and implementing a project. I think it's such an important point. And also to your first point, that sometimes the right course of action is not to do the research at all. 
Um, I'm going to pass now to Ariel to talk about some of the ways that you implement ethics in the work that you do and what the benefits of that are. Yeah, so um, I think I would definitely echo Steph's point that um, ethics is not a, a, a box to be ticked and a, a, just a simple form to be filled out. Um, we really do try and uh, consider it to be a continuous process of reflection and um, consideration um, throughout projects that we work on at the Tools, Practices and Systems Programme, um, particularly those that we, where we're working in concert with um, groups that might be marginalised or, or um, be sort of traditionally people who research is done to rather than done with. Um, there's always, you know, something new to consider and reflect on and then change course, depending on um, the information and the discussion that we have with um, those folks. I think the other point I would like to make as well on this is embedding ethics is a, a 360 degree process as well. So it's not only continuous, but you should and you should be thinking about um, the impact of your work on um, the people who are are participating in the research and you know potentially being impacted by the research outputs but you should also think about the people who are doing that research and the conditions in which they're doing that research um, and they're also not passive participants they're active participants um, in the work so they should also be considering you know the, the ethics of um, the work that they're doing and the conditions in which they're working as well and sort of having this conversation and this dialogue. So I wouldn't say that anybody in um, the process should be passive and, and kind of just having things put on them. Everybody can take an active part in this. Um, specifically at the Turing um, and in TPS, we're very aware of the volunteer work that supports our projects. Um, we do find ways to actively acknowledge and credit contributors to make sure that they're benefiting um, and receiving, you know, um, credit for the work that they put into some of our projects. For example, the Turing Way has over 300 contributors, um, but when you uh, have people who are invited to give talks on the Turing Way, um, the co-leads are, are very keen to make sure that it's not just um, the two project co-leads that are presenting and representing the project, but actually the people who are contributing to the project as well, getting that recognition um, for the work that they put in. Um, and one other aspect I also wanted to highlight, um, particularly relevant um, for uh, research software engineers, is that we build um, contribution to open source projects in as part of role descriptions for um, folks who are part of the program. So they're actively expected um, to be spending some time contributing to open source um, projects because of the aims and the values of the program itself. Um, I know this is a bit of a thorny issue for, um, for open source, how to manage volunteer contributions and um, fair, you know, recompense for people's uh, labour on projects. Um, but that's one of the ways that we're, we're tackling that um, at the programme. Thanks, Ariel. Yes, extremely good points around recognising different contributions and also recognising the volunteer and paid labour that goes into a lot of work. Um, I think this is a really important and often under-referenced point to do with working ethically uh, in software and in research. And I'm going to pass now to Andrew to, uh, to talk about some of the ways that you implement ethics in the work that you do and how it strengthens your work. Yeah, well, I mean, just massive agreement with everyone before. I mean, the notion that ethics isn't a tech box exercise and a continuous process of reflection is a key one uh, that I think we, we hold true in our work. Um, I'm really struck always by, by something that Shannon Valor from Edinburgh once said to me, which I think is a really, really good way of framing ethics. That it's a set of lenses that allow you to look at a problem and it's meant to encourage a reflexive engagement with those questions. And it's meant to be a continuous engagement. It, it's meant to follow all through the different stages of the life cycle of, a, of an AI system or, or a data-driven system from the early ideation phase to your data collection, to your sort of research methodology, all the way through to the point when you're kind of thinking about, you know, are you gonna turn this into a product or are you gonna license this to somebody? Are you gonna make this available publicly via an open source um, platform? And I, th those are all kinds of things that I think are, are critical for us to think about. And when we talk about the, the sort of moment that we're in right now, it feels like a lot of the questions that we're grappling with as, as developers and as researchers are focused on a, creating a culture of, of more engagement and reflexive, reflexive consideration of those potential issues and impacts. Um, and I think a lot of that is about is the kind of broader subtle impact 
of what you're trying to do. You know, I think research ethics is this term that's very unhelpful, right? It's often talking about just the methodology of your research. Um, when, uh, you know, RRI or broader self impact questions are kind of more of the thing that come up when we think about some of the most egregious examples of, of ethical issues arising. And it's incredibly important as researchers and developers, we think about that, right? Like it's terrible for our field, for your own career, for, for, um, for, for your own sort of benefit, let alone for the people you're affecting if your research causes harm. And so uh, that's why I think engaging with these kinds of practical reflexive exercises is so important as an entire academic uh, sort of field of study, let alone as an individual. And some of the ways we've done that in practice, I'm, I'll pull one example that we've used um, uh, from, from my time in industry was uh, really around trying to focus on reflexive documentation exercises. Um, those, those exercises like model cards or data sheets where you're trying to actively write out and document who your stakeholders are, what you think the potential impacts of this work will be, how you've tested it for bias or what intended uses you envision happening. Um, the piece that we, we never got to, and this is where I think there's more to be done is how do you not only identify your stakeholders, but engage with them? Um, you don't want a situation in which you're just in a sort of ivory tower, just thinking up potential issues and impacts. You wanna really co-create those with affected communities. And to take another example of some work we've done at Ada Lovelace Institute, we've just finished a project with the NHS that's trying to get at this exact uh, kind of uh, issue. It's, it involves an algorithmic impact assessment um, um, exercise that part of it involves engaging with a panel of patients, clinicians, and others who will be affected by the um, medical AI services that are, would be developed. And you, you literally can't get data access if you don't engage with this panel. You're co-creating the impacts with them. It's a, it's a model that we think works in this very specific bespoke um, sort of context, but we'd love to see other um, uh, researchers and, and, and teams engage with that kind of exercise, you know, really pushing the limits on, on that kind of stakeholder engagement and um, creating better products. And I just in terms of the benefits it adds, I mean, it, it is enormous benefits. It makes your products better, safer. Um, it makes, it helps you identify also just like what are the ways in which if this is gonna be integrated well, what are the requirements for it to be integrated well? What needs to happen for that to occur? Uh, that all gets to, I think, the big goal that we're trying to achieve, which is we want our research to be of, of social benefit. We want it to, to, to be used in the world. Uh, and for that to happen, it does involve close engagement with affected communities. Um, yeah, I'll end there, but very excited to be talking more about this. Thanks, Andrew. Yes, and I think uh, I think pick up on, on set well. Many excellent points there, but I think particularly around the benefits of engaging ethically in the fact that there, there really is no benefit to not, you know, there's actual harm to not, not doing ethical research and building software ethically. Um, and to pick up on your point about engaging with stakeholders, I'm going to move now to the next question around um, thinking about the different people who are involved in research and particularly research where we're building software to support that research. Um, I, I think it's really important, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak now about who the different stakeholders are and how they how they should be engaged, and particularly what are the power dynamics that can come into play um, that we need to be aware of. I think this has been touched on before, but I'd like to give the panelists uh, some time to, to talk more about this. So we could start with Ariel. Yeah, so um, picking up on the thread of uh, what I said previously about, um, you know, it not just being uh, sort of the research subjects, but also the people who are participating in research um, that are should be taking ethical considerations into account. And I want to, to really emphasize the point that um, it, it shouldn't be just the PI of a project who is thinking about ethics. It should be everybody involved in a project. And people, particularly, say, research software engineers, who a, a lot of people on, the, on this um, call are, you know, that sometimes it can feel as though they're, they're being brought into a project where um, things have already been decided, maybe the, the ethics form has already been submitted, and they maybe don't feel as empowered to speak up and um, have a say on, you know, the ethical implications or problems that they see with the projects. Um, but they should. And because it's really important that everybody participates in this process. Um, and so this is where I, I kind of want to highlight that um, it's really powerful to, to feel as though you have a, collect, a community or a collective group that are, will back you if you want to um, uh, raise issues or, or say uh, speak out on ethical concerns on projects that you become aware of. Um, I, I speak to a lot of folks who have 
kind of taken on the challenge of changing the system um, on their own. Um, I was speaking on a, a panel on research infrastructure roles and the, a really common refrain was, oh, I tried to change academia and it was very, very hard. So I moved out of it and made a deliberate decision not to. Um, I think one of my responses to that is that it's almost impossible to change the system on your own as an individual, and it shouldn't be an individual's responsibility to, to try and change the entire system, but it is the responsibility of everybody to change the system. And that's where the importance of collective action comes in, because you can often feel very powerless as one person um, to raise an issue on a, a project, say, if you've become aware of ethical concerns, or you know, terrible working conditions or um, unsustainable workloads. Um, but that's where collective action, unions and organized resistance to the system is what achieves changes within the system as well. So there are growing numbers of um, uh, workers at tech companies. Um, a few come to mind um, such as, oh, <laughs> such as the um, folks who are organizing the um, Deliveroo riders and the courier drivers um, that are being unfairly uh, targeted by apps that are created. Um, there are a lot of people at the large tech companies, so Google, Facebook, Apple, that are organizing um, against not only policy decisions, but also for better um, labor conditions, pay, sick leave, etc. And so this is where we're starting to see a real um, real sea change people are not sort of thinking that tech is this one uniformly uh, brilliant force for good or two um sort of an isolated system that they kind of where people just show up and work on problems and then whatever happens to them is so whatever happens to the work that they do is somebody else's problem later on to figure out the ethics people are taking that um taking on board the idea that um, you know ethics is something that everybody should be involved in, should be thinking about, um, and are organising collectively to influence the decisions and the policies of, of companies. Um, and I do also want to highlight here as well um, about the recent UCU strikes. So this is the University and Colleges Union um, that uh, some of you on this call will be familiar with. It's the uh, main higher education um, union in the UK. Um, they are still in the middle of um, a huge round of strikes that have been ongoing essentially since 2018 um, around pay, pensions and working conditions as well. So these are people who are actively out on picket lines at the moment, um, who are recognising that the, um, the work that they do is unsustainable, that the expectations are unsustainable. They want to challenge the way that um, their organizations are run, the policy decisions they make, um, particularly around things like um, working from home, um, safety in the classroom as well, um, with the ongoing pandemic, um, and they're out there actively um, fighting for those changes as well. Um, and we have seen some incredible victories. Um, after, I really want to highlight that after incredible sustained action up in Liverpool, um, I think it was uh, over 300 job cuts were avoided by collective action um, and they retain, I think they wound up only losing two members of staff after um, sustained collective action. So this kind of this kind of collective action, the walkouts, the um, labour organising, so the a Amazon um, uh, on Staten Island have recently um, voted to form a, a labour union as well, which is an amazing victory. Um, this type of work is, uh, you know, an integral part of, of ethics and should be things that people are thinking about um, when they're sort of doing their work. <laughs> um, but I really think that, uh, yeah, sorry, just to kind of sum up here and so you can move on, um, that sometimes it can feel as though you're the only voice in the room or you're the only one who's thinking about ethics. And I think we do need to change that. We need to change that perspective. Um, and help people link up and, and fight back as, uh, as part of a group or to feel confident raising issues as part of a group and to ensure that those issues do get raised and the policies do change and we do see some systemic change around the considerations that are taken into account with research. Thank you, Ariel. I think, yes, very good point, particularly around uh, the, the value of collective action. Um, that it's often that yes, it's incredibly difficult to change any system on your own. But 
as even a small group of people working together can be incredibly powerful. And so there's real value in collective action, particularly in challenging some of the really unhealthy um, uh, power dynamics that lead to uh, ethical problems. Um, I'm going to ask Garnet now to come in here because I know policy has done a lot of work around, um, I think a lot about power and about feminist ways of working and particularly around um, the impact of extractive uh, research in um, global South countries. So I'd love it, Garnet, if you could come in and talk about some of that work. Um, yes. Uh, so, sorry, what, what's the question again? So I'm asking around, um, sorry, I should have restated the original question. So talking now about um, some of the power dynamics that can come into play when we're talking about research, and one that I'm anxious to bring in here because we have a, a, a fairly global North focused audience um, at CW that I think it's really important to talk about some of the international dimensions and particularly some of the um, post-colonial dimensions of research, particularly in software where we use a lot of tech tools that span national borders. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Right. Um, immediately, when I think of power dynamics in, in the kind of research that we do, so we a lot of our research uh, policy in East Africa and even other African countries is with vulnerable and marginalized communities, right? And so when we're doing research, for instance, with LGBTQI people, we have found that I think in I, I think I remember thinking about this the other day. One of our in one of the countries we're researching, I'm not sure if it's Uganda, I think it's Uganda, right? Um, with the ethics board process, you have to list some of the participants that are, are going to take part in the study, right? But then when you're working with LGBTQI people in a country like Uganda, that already puts them at risk. So I think for us, just understanding the power dynamics um, when it comes to such research is also just realizing that the ethical implications for this research is that people could lose their lives in, in some of the countries that we work in, right? And so just figuring out workarounds around such ethics board procedures, um, working to ensure that our respondents are, are like their data is stored very privately. We do not, we make sure we anonymize um, their data. We probably, we don't take pictures because sometimes it's standard, like when you're going to field, like for field work, you want to take pictures to, to show back to the team. We don't take pictures of such research because already you're putting people at risk. And I think another thing when it comes to working with such communities is that as a researcher, you're probably coming from a place where, for instance, I'm a straight researcher, right? I, I really can't go into an, a queer community for such research. We prefer to, having, to have somebody from the community do the research instead, right? So then your respondents feel safer and they're able to share um, and it's in a, in, a, in a place where they feel comfortable sharing with a person that's, that they're familiar with, right? So just understanding such dynamics. I think another important one I, I realize every day is when you're working on digital inequality and you're trying to understand how people feel about such things, right? And, and I remember with COVID last year, we couldn't um, go meet people in person. So we had to go to, we had to turn to, to Zoom research. And we found that people, wouldn't show up to sessions that they had signed up for because of data. Um, Zoom is a very data consuming um, platform, right? So, and just thinking about how do we make sure that our participants are facilitated, right? I think this is something we don't take lightly, especially in an African context where people want to participate, but they can't afford it for the most part. So how do you make sure people feel valued um, people feel like their contribution is valued and their time is valued. We like we practice feminist research where people are experts over their own lives and experts get paid for their time, right? Whether it's a student in university taking part in your research, they're all experts over their own lives. That's why you're asking them for this information. That's why you're asking them to take part in your study. And, and part of the way, um, one of the ways we, we make them feel valued is compensating them could be data refunds, transport refunds, if we had them come to a specific specific venue. Even thinking about things like lunch, right? We don't, like, you don't think about that 
But then you have people coming to take part in your study because they're really interested, but they probably didn't even have breakfast when they were coming. So just thinking about such things, right? And I think having this ethical, cons I mean, thinking about this power dynamics gives you better participation and better engagement. Like if people know that they're going to be valued, like just looking at the history of research on the continent, I don't think people think about respondents in, in such a way, like they're just participants, like we're just going to feel to collect data. And nobody thinks about how much it took for these people to come to the community center to give their answers, right? And we're trying to shift that. Um, just, yeah, and it, it, it enhances participation. We find that people are more willing to participate when, when they feel valued. And I think that's a small way we're looking at changing how um, people think about pie dynamics. Thank you, Ghana. I think that's such a good point that recognizing that when you're asking people to participate, you are asking them as experts and expertise should be valued um, is such an important one, but it quite often gets lost, um, particularly when we're doing research, when people from the global north are doing research in the global south. So I think it's such an important point. Um, I'm going to ask Steph now uh, to, to comment on some of the power dynamics that can come into play in the work that you do and, and how that how you manage that. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I, yeah, amazingly great points that were just being made. Um, I totally agree, like asking the questions and trying to really be mindful about, okay, where is the money going? It's very important. And also how can we make sure that we can, like especially in academia, how can we make sure that we can and we are active and trying to redirect resources that as academics, we might be in a more privileged position to access. How can we redirect them to other communities? And it's a question I'm starting to grapple with at the moment. And it's, it doesn't have an easy answer and it, it highly depends on the funder. Unfortunately, like the, there, is, there are many different funding models out there and some are more or less um, appropriate to pay people properly. And that's, yeah, and I, I find and this space I find it like fascinating and definitely still without a good um, answer on how exactly to do it. Um, but I do think it's a very important one. Um, in my volunteer work, it, as the word implies, there is, it's a it's a different dynamic because that the kind of case does rely a lot on volunteers, which um, which usually do come from a more potentially privileged space of being able to volunteer in the first place. So how to handle those power dynamics, then it's, it's, um, it changes because it, it, it's, it's not, um, it's been trying really hard to like not overwork them or like to make sure that everyone can benefit. Um, but then you do want to make sure that everyone can benefit and that um, the situations is not skewed one way or another. And, um, and yeah, there is there are lots of um, thoughts on there on like how how to make that happen. And um, I do think that again, resources is a great like making sure that the money is there and goes to good use is important. Like okay, fine, we're not paying volunteers, but maybe could we we could have uh, or like there could be an idea of like a two parallel stream, like a volunteer or a paid internship. Um, so, um, or also, yeah, and, and the, the, the second thing is, yeah, dialogue, like it's making sure that all parties um, are involved with each other so that there, there is this, um, uh, th there is communication ongoing and it balances a bit more in terms of benefits. Really good point, Steph. Thank you. I think particularly about um, thinking about where funding is coming from and where it's going and maintaining communication with people who are involved in the research that you're doing is super, super important. Um, and I'm going to pass now to Andrew to talk about some of the power dynamics that, that you've encountered in your work and how you um, manage those relationships and how you address power. Yeah, um, I, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One that Ariel already touched on, which I think is a really important one, particularly with AI and, and, and machine learning research, is just 
the incredible importance of data enrichment workers who are the literally the reason why we're able to do this work in the first place. Like they, they are uh, an essential and oftentimes completely uh, un, un, uh, rewarded uh, uh, component of this research. And in thinking about how to reward them, you know, the first thought is obviously compensation, which I think, you know, that is not even a standard within the industry, but it's something that needs to be more thoroughly discussed. Um, there need to be more institutional policies that dictate like what are the right practices and particularly the ways in which, um, unfortunately, I've seen some researchers like abuse sort of systems like MTurk to, to get free labor out of, of um, uh, out of a contract by sort of canceling the contract after the work's been done. Um, but the other part of that as well is just is thinking beyond compensation. What is it that those workers want? How can you how can you um, provide some form of reciprocity to meet their needs? Um, it's not necessarily going to be just in, in um, attributing them by name in, in a paper that might not mean anything to them. But it's important to ask that question um, and to engage with with those communities. There are you don't need to necessarily find every single MTurk worker that you've ever worked with and ask. But there are communities on Reddit, the MTurk um, work that Lily Ronnie is running, who which all are aimed at trying to provide a source of guidance and voice of contact for for what are the kinds of actions you as a researcher can take to um, better support that um, data enrichment workers. And then the other thing that comes to mind is just is the, the variety of, of sort of non-obvious stakeholders for the kind of work that I think um, often comes up in AI and machine learning research that uh, we don't think about, but that are you know have a very significant um, impact on uh, its success and its use. Um, I often use this one example of a uh, uh, someone who was was uh, sort of thinking uh, using a um, developing a tool that was meant to be uh, integrated into a hospital. Uh, which would have sort of a, 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 essentially helps doctors diagnose patients from a, a tablet in their hand. And um, they talked with uh, sort of healthcare professionals in the abstract. They um, talked with uh, sort of some, some patients even about how exciting this would be. The one group they didn't talk to is nurses. And <laughs> nurses are the most important group, if you think about it, because they're the ones who are actually providing and using the software. And the thing completely failed. It led to the complete uh, um, um, loss of this uh, a company's product and, and all their contracts were canceled because it just didn't fit well with the way that nurses worked. Um, so, you know, I think that those kinds of stakeholder evaluations, considering like who is uh, using your, your technology and what are the power dynamics that exist between different users of your, of your system is really key. Um, in that case, that was a situation in which the way that nurses were, uh, this, this system was sort of changing the dynamic of how doctors trusted the, the judgment of nurses led to nurses not trusting it. And that broke the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's one of those ways in which you need to be very careful and very uh, reflexive about the ways in which these, these very complex social, dynam uh, social technical dynamics that we're, we're trying to operate in operate if you're, if you're going to have a successful product. So yeah, I just want to say massive, massive support to all, all the other comments that, that the uh, other panelists have said and just to, to really reemphasize the importance of doing that kind of stakeholder mapping and deep reflexive consideration and study of what it is you're trying to accomplish and what kinds of environment you're trying to roll your technology into. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, really good points around just making sure you get the right stakeholders involved and particularly important to think about the crowd workers on who are completely essential for a lot of data work and yet are often completely invisible in uh, and don't get recognized in the work that we do. Uh, we've got two minutes left on the panel. Um, so thank you all so much. I'm going to ask you very quickly to briefly talk to say um, what specific resources um, or techniques would you point the attendees today to, to help them continue to use ethical lenses and use ethical uh, development in their work. I'm going to start with Garnet. So sorry, what was the question again? So sorry. Uh, specific examples of resources that you point attendees to to help them with uh, ethics in their work. Right. Um, so I think the way we think about this, uh, I don't think I'm going to point people out to a specific resource, but to feminist values and also just values espoused by decolonial theory. So I think when you take a feminist approach to research, there are just some values already embedded in it. You have intersectionality, like how do you meet people where they're at? How do you understand how their different experiences could shape how they participate in research or the kind of responses that they give you, right? You have accountability. How are you held accountable for the, the way you're conducting research? And I think that's something that's really enshrined in, in feminist research um, methods. 
contestation? Do your people, do the people you're researching have the autonomy and agency to 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 resist um, the kind of methods you're using? Like, what if they feel that like some questions are invasive? How how can they go against that, right? And how are you as a researcher um, going to be held accountable if you um, don't do the right thing? Um, how are you going to like transparency, how are you going to share how you conducted the research and, and make it available to everyone? Um, and I think another feminist value in research is that it's not just for knowledge production, but it's also for positive social change. The goal of feminist research is not always just to produce data and produce knowledge, but also to impact people positively. And I think that's the most important one, right? Like, what are the outcomes of this research? Does it cause harm to people? Like, how can we improve the lives of the people we're researching or the lives of the people who are doing this research with us? Like, yeah. And and then with decolonial, um, just decolonial theory, how how is the research fair? Like, are the the risks of research, this, the research we're studying, are they distributed fairly or are they just being um, piled on the marginalized communities, right? Safety, diversity, resistance. How can our respondents resist us as researchers? And I think these are just some of the values we think about when we're doing. That's great. Thank you so much, Garnet. We've gone a little bit over time, so I'm going to put some more research resources in the uh, Slack channel, and I'm going to invite the other panelists to do that as well. But I think to end on the, the point that Garnet made that positive social change is something that we're all working towards um, in the research that we're doing, in the software that we're building. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Garnet, Steph, Ariel, and Andrew for participating today. Um, and thank you to Rachel for organizing. And I'll hand back to Rachel now as the organizer. Thank you so much. <laughs>